following lecture was produced by Glorianne Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. Rune Perth, also called Pertra, Pertro, Peord, Pero, Plaster. His meaning is rock, stone, the sound P. The Master Samael Veor, when talking about the rock, the stone, in the book of uh, Gnostic Magic of the Runes, state, I saw the chariot of the centuries, which was driven by three masters of the White Lodge. And a venerable elder was in this chariot of mystery. <clears throat> How can I forget such a face, such a countenance, such an appearance, such sublime perfection? The forehead of that elder was certainly high and majestic. His nose, straight, perfect, his lips, fine and delicate. His ears small and recoiled, his beard white and with an aureola of light. And his hair of an immaculate whiteness was falling over his shoulders. It is obvious that I could not stop inquiring about him, since he was terribly divine and formidable. The name of him is Peter answered one of the hierophants who was driving the chariot of the centuries. Then after, O oh God of mine, I abased myself on the ground before this elder of the centuries and filled with infinite love and compassion while speaking in the golden language he blessed me. Since then, I have reflected a lot and I will never be sorry for having taught humanity the gospel of Peter, the Maituna sex yoga. So, Peter is, of course, related in the tree of life with the first Sephira. Or the tree of life. Which is Keter. The father of all the lights. In the physiology. This word uh, needs to be explained. It comes from the physicality and logos. From the Gnostic point of view, physiology is a relationship of the physical body with the Logos, with the Word. So, 
In physiology, we have studied that Peter is related with the pineal gland. The pineal gland relates to the chakra Sahasrara, which is called the crown chakra. That's why Keter is a crown related with that chakra. But Keter, indeed, is related with the three primary forces. Keter is the head of the Holy Three Unity or Trinity. Keter, Chokmah, Binah, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Which are exactly in the head, in our physiology. Peter, it is stated, is the head of the church. Peter is the one that is called Cephas in the Gospel of John. Which I declare, says Jesus of Nazareth, means stone, rock. And upon this rock, I will build my church. A very profound statement that encloses all the mystery of the ruined Perth, Peter. Which, when talking in Kabbalah, we disclose that he is related with the first mystery, because the first mystery is Keter, and with the 24th mystery. All of you, I hope, have the Gnostic Bible, Pistis Sophia, which is a great Kabbalistic teaching given by the Master Jesus to his disciples, to his apostles. In it, when you start reading, it describes that the father of all delights, Keter, is the first mystery, which is also the 24th mystery, which is explained with a sixth mystery. If you don't know Kabbalah, then you remain in the space, floating, trying to find the first mystery in the 24th and the sixth. Peter, of course, encloses the whole thing because it is the mystery of the great work that all of us have to perform within ourselves. The whole work is called in the first mystery the completion of completions. The completion of completions, the first mystery, is equal to the 24th mystery, which is the mystery of the weaver. The Divine Mother Weaving and weaving in the loom of God, the great work. So here we find how Peter is related to the first mystery and the 24th mystery. The Divine Mother, space. Because when we study Kabbalah, in relation with the Divine Mother, we find that there are three Marys, according to Christianity. The three Marys are called, in Sanskrit, in Hinduism, the three Devis, three Devi which is a female aspect of the Trinity. I repeat, in Christianity, uh, they talk about the three Marys. Mary in the space, Mary in nature, 
and marry in our own physicality. And this is very important to understand because Peter is related with them. We know very well that in the pineal gland we have an atom of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is Shiva, the third Logos. So therefore, the third Logos in Kabbalah is that aspect of the Trinity that relates to the three Devi. Bina, the Holy Spirit, relates to the Trinity, the Trinity. That's why in Hinduism they say that Sarasvati is the wife of Brahma. Lakshmi is the wife of Vishnu. And Parvati, the wife of Shiva. Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva. Sarasvati, Lakshmi, Parvati. The three Devi with their res respect, uh, respectively or respected uh, husbands. Behold here, we always state that the Holy Trinity is not uh, three males, but three androgynous forces. The Father is androgynous, the Son is androgynous, and the Holy Spirit is androgynous. But this wonderful androgenism is shown through the Holy Spirit, Bina. Because the Divine Mother is that feminine aspect of the Holy Spirit, called Shiva, Shakti. That's why when we talk about Peter, we have to talk about the feminine aspect, and the male aspect, because he is in that crown chakra. So this is the mystery of Perth that we have to understand. And of course, these three Devi are synthesized in the 24th mystery, which is the weaver, the Divine Mother that works in the great work. This is what the Master Samael and all alchemists call the time. If you recall, uh, in many lectures, I always said the time, times and a half of a time. We will give you now a clue for you in order to easily understand this. It's deeper, but easy. The time is the 24th Arcanum. Because to the 24th Arcanum, the Weaver, the Divine Mother, performs the great work which is the first mystery, the completion of completions, which is, of course, Keter, the head of all the Sephiroth, the manifested Sephiroth of the Tree of Life. And what is the half of that time? Twelve, right? The apostleship, the apostolate. Behold the twelve apostles. Behold the 12 hours of Apollonius, which, as you know, are always related with light and darkness. 12 hours of light, 12 hours of darkness, 24. It's the whole time. This is the, the, the completion of completion is 24 hours. And the half is 12. The work that we had to do with our own physicality, physiology, psychology. But we, we have to start in the bottom in order to ask for us to understand. So, time and the half of a time. 
is 12. And half of that 12 is 6. The 6 are canon. The Master says it clearly. The first mystery is the 24th mystery, which is explained with the 6th mystery. Matthew Samael says, I will explain the remaining part of the Pisti Sophia at the half of the half of the time. If the time is at 24, the half is 12, and the half of that 12 is 6, Tiferet. Simple. That nobody sees it. Because our mind is complicated. So the half of the half of the time is Tiferet. Or if you want, uh, in other ways, if the completion of completion is a self-realization of the sephir, the tree of life in ourselves, the half of the tree of life is the middle column. And the half of that middle column is Tiferet. So you make the cross. You see how easy it is to see it when you meditate, when you analyze things Kabbalistically, alchemically. And what do we have in the center of the tree of life? Tifereth, which is the sun. Right? So the sun, as you end, is also <coughs> in the very center of the Aztec calendar. Because all the mystery of the sun is the mystery of the microcosmos. There is a saying, a statement in esotericism that says, I am as thou art, and thou art as much as I am. In other words, the man, the microcosmos, he says the man is a microcosmos of the macrocosmos. That's why in Kabbalah you see the huge face is a macrocosmos called Arikampin. And the small face is called Serampin. So the huge face is the solar light, the sun, that we have to have in our heart. So that is precisely... I am as much as, as you are, and you are as much as I am. But for that, you have to go into the archetypes that we have within. And that is represented, of course, by Tonatiu, in the center of the Aztec calendar, which in a previous lecture I told you, uh, related with the Rum Gibor, the Rum Gibor cannot turn or cannot spin around if there is not breath. Remember that the, mic, the macro cosmos, the huge cosmos, the huge face, is represented by the first rune that we talk about, the rune Hagal, which is represented by the H. That H is the breath. Sigh coming from the absolute. The ray of Okianak is called the eternal cosmic breath, which is profoundly unknowable to itself. And in order to become knowable to itself, expresses itself through Keter, the huge face. That's why Keter is represented by Aleph, as we said in many other lectures, which is the air, the breath. And that breath is in the lungs. The first letter that represents Aleph, or the first sound, is A, ah, A. Ah. Remember that when we vocalize the letter A, ah, the sound A, ah, we concentrate in the middle of the lungs. Hmm? Where we have, of course, the air. The bellows are the lungs. 
아, 아담. Begins with Aleph. And of course, that vowel that rotates there is related with the thymus gland. The thymus gland comes from the Greek word tumos, which also means breath or soul, spirited. And that's why here is where we have John. E, E, O, U, Ams. I said John, the seven vowels. The word, which is related with the essence, the Buddha that we have there, that we, hold, we, we have to multiply, that we have to make it grow inside of us. And that's why John is always behind the heart. And the heart is Jesus, the atom nous. You find that John is resting his head on the chest of Jesus. That John is that consciousness that we have within. That is waiting for us. To start the great work. Why is that part of the Logos? Because John, the consciousness, is part of the Logos that we have within. And wants to self-realize, to, to, wants to multiply, wants to grow inside of us. That's why John is always represented by a young boy, which is a Burata. That's why it's in the, in the thymus gland. And behold here the relationship of the thymus gland with the child. A woman, when he's pregnant, is uh, forming that child in her womb. As the mother formed that, those bodies that we had to create within our individual womb. But after that child goes out, the mother feeds that child with her breasts. The breasts are related with the thymus gland. Through the breast, through that milk, is how the mother transmits protection to the child for his or her immune system. You know, the thymus gland is in relation with the immune system. When that uh, gland is open, I mean, when the corpse is open, in order to see the, the gland, usually the doctors find very dried land. I mean, gland, not like uh, in the young people, that the gland is very big. And the old people is always small, shrink. And that's why they thought that the thymus gland was not working in uh, adult people. But the thing is that the thymus gland contains all the all defenses when you are sick. And that's why it's important for the mother to give her milk to her child in order for the child to take those elements that he needs in order to fortify his immune system against any disease. Obviously, when we are sick, the thymus gland fights a lot in order to spell that sickness. But when the thymus gland fails, the person dies. And when you open that corpse, you find a very small, dried thymus. Why? Because it was fighting a lot. This is, this is the reason why. Now the scientists are saying that that is the reason why. Before they were saying, no, no, no. It never works in adults, only in, in, in children. But do you see the relationship of the thymus gland with our own life? And that's why the mother transmits that love, that emotional force to the thymus gland. Because in it is, the, is John, the essence 
But it's the first force that we got because when we come out of the womb of the mother, we scream or we vocalize, ah, as we explained. That ah is the activity of the consciousness within the body. That ah resounds between the lungs with the breath of God. That ah is the Adam or the very prototype or archetype, we will say, of Adam, which is the essence that is there inside of our body. <coughs> and of course, this is very important to understand and to comprehend with Perth, because this rune relates to the breathing, breathing system through which we can perform the great work. Remember that we explained that Peter relates to the science of breathing, the science of breathing. And of course, remember that in the very root of our nose, we have the atom of the father, Keter. In the pituitary gland, we have the atom of the son, and in the pineal, the atom of the Holy Spirit. The three magnetic centers are related with the crown, the three primary forces, which the master explains. He saw three charioteers driving the chariot of the centuries. The three charioteers are the three primary forces, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But the one that was inside the chariot was Peter. Because he is the one that through the pineal gland act through the three breaths of the Akasha, as we call it in Sanskrit. The three breaths of the Akasha, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, enters through the puffers, which are the nostrils. And we breathe them. The lungs take them, which are the bellows. That's why the Master Samael states, the secret of transmutation is, are in the nostrils, the puffers, and the bellows, which are the lungs, because in the bellows are the breath of God. And the nostrils are related with the two polarities of the tree of life. Ida I mean the tree of knowledge of good and evil, Ida and Pingala. And talking about the tree of good and evil, you have to understand that it's in relation with that in the tree of life that relates to the throat. But we talk about the throat and how the throat is related with the breath in previous lecture, with the logos, with the word. And of course, <coughs> these three breaths of Akasha, which between parentheses is the Divine Mother space, the feminine aspect of Keter, Akasha, the Mother space. But within it are the three forces, or the three breaths of the Absolute that enter into through our nostrils in order to descend and to activate the akasha that we have in the sexual organs how do we call these three breaths in the physical body they descend to the three chords ida pingala and shushu na those are the three we know very well that Pingala is related with the father. Ida is related with the mother. And Shushumna is related to the son. Those are the three characters that we are talking about. Because the one that is directing those characters are in the, is in the pineal gland. It's Peter. And Peter controls that in the rock. The rock, of course, 
has many symbols, but in simple words, we we'll said is sex, the cubic stone, the philosophical stone of Jesod. That's why it is stated that Peter has the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Those keys, of course, are related with these three forces, especially with two. Because in order to awake the third force in Shushumna, you have to manipulate Ida in Pingala. This was explained in the previous lecture. So that's why this birth is very profound and closes the science of the great work. It's very simple to see when you have eyes to see. And of course, that's why in the very center of the Aztec calendar, you find that the very center, the very center is the nose. In the nose, you find a singulus, or that uh, horizontal little road underneath the nose. What do you find in that singulus? You find three feathers in each side. It relates to the three primary forces of both sexes, men and women. The three feathers, the three breaths of Akasha that we are talking about, that enter to the nostrils. If you observe the nose of Tonatiu, it resembles the rune Perth lying down. The two nostrils and the horizontal line, the nose. Easy to see. But this rune really is also deeper in the sign that you find the very center of the Aztec calendar. <coughs> if you observe the Aztec calendar, the center, you find, as we explained, that is related with the rune Hagal, with the H, which is the breath. And of course, the horizontal line is cut in in the middle, forming a six-pointed star. So the horizontal line that is cut in the X in this uh, Aztec calendar have in each side the paws or the jaws of a jower, which is a symbol in, in, in the Mayan pantheon of Lucifer or Solotl, it said in the Aztec pantheon, Solotl. This Solotl, Lucifer, is a sexual potency that should be controlled through the heart. You see the horizontal line is dividing the X. And the two paths, of course, are the two polarities, feminine and masculine. But also because they are holding the heart relates to good and evil, or we will say, to the two flows of blood in our heart. Remember that we have the impure blood and the pure blood. And that is, of course, pumped by the might of the fifth sun. Who is the fifth son? S-U-N. Well, you know, we had uh, many times said that the fifth son is Samael, related with Geburah. Geburah is might. Geburah is that might that contracts and expands, contracts and expands in the heart. Without Geburah, the blood the blood would go, would, would, would not flow through the different areas of the body. 
to the, to the different uh, vessels, veins, arteries. Geburah is that strand that contracts the heart and push all the blood out of the heart. So the heart is different. But we know in Kabbalah that the sun, S-U-N, that governs Tifereth, also governs Geburah. Master Samael on Veor states that in the book of Kabbalah. Many think that Geburah is ruled by Mars, but it's also ruled by the sun. So we have here two suns. The suns in Tifereth and the sun in Geburah. See with your imagination these two suns. The son of Geburah is Hercules, the mighty Hercules that changed the flowing of the river into another direction. And that's why Jacob in the Bible is fighting with Samael, because Jacob is a heart in Samael is Geburah. Between both of them are flowing in the blood. These two flows of energy are called in Hebrew Zav or Sab Sabit Sabot Zain Bet Tav. That is the flow of energy that says the book of Genesis that the rivers of Eden flow with milk and honey, right? So that flowing, that flow is sain bet. That's to flow in Hebrew, in Kabbalah, which also means wolf, wolf. Wolf in Latin is lupus. Do you hear that uh, sickness? Lupus erythematoso, the fire that comes on the surface of the skin and is eating the skin as a wolf. That's called lupus. But in the Spanish, these uh, wolves or lupus are called lobos, plural. Here you have your hair called lobos. This force of Hercules which is the red star, Geburah, that's Mars, that shines with the sun as well. Two sun is in the sky. This is the doctrine of Peter. Do you see that? Because that shines in the sixth dimension in heaven. You can, you can see that with your spiritual eyes. You will see how Geburah and Tifereth are two suns. And the two flows of energy that are related with the science of breathing. That's why the horizontal line has two paths that are squeezing hearts. That's the might of Samael, the might of Geburah. Like telling to the heart, work, work, throw the blood, take the blood, throw the blood, take it, you see? You realize that? That solotl is a power in the body, the fire of Lucifer, life, light and life inside of us. <coughs> now, in the center... Of that line, what do you see? You see the sun, right? That sun is Tifereth. That's the heart. If you take that line out, it uh, places vertically to the two other parts of the Hagal. And then you find one V above and another V below. Which form 
a cup. Behold the cup that I'm talking about. The Master Samael says, but then, what about the Holy Grail? Isn't, isn't perhaps the same initiatic stone? Behold, I laid in Zion a chief corner stone, elect precious, unto you therefore which believe he is precious. But unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner, in a stone of stumbling, in a rock of offense. So the Holy Grail is the same stone. But why? We have to study that. Because that is the science of Peter. The vertical line that we took out of the center of the Aztec calendar with the two hearts, one point is above and the other below. One is above, which is the man, and another is below, the woman. Simple as it is. The cup above, the, su the superior V, begins from the throat to the top of the head. And the other begins from Yasad down, the foundation. So both foundation and vessel above that is forming the Holy Grail is uh, the sacred cup which everybody was looking for. It is still they are just inventing things. Well then, they said that is Mary Magdalene. Yeah. Didn't we say that Mary Magdalene is our physicality? Didn't we say that Malkut is feminine? So then behold, the philosophical stone and the Holy Grail is our own physicality, our own physical body. Malkut, the very foundation, the very bottom of the tree of life, is at the Holy Grail. So people were looking for the Holy Grail while they were moving their own particular individual Holy Grail, physical body, that represents the top. You see? If you see any cup, symbol, for instance, we place that, this symbol of that uh, cup in the graphics. Beside that is precisely the symbol of the cup as well, but in runic alphabet. Perth. The top of that chalice begins, I said, from the larynx up. And the bottom, which is the foundation, from Yesod, the sex, down. If you open your legs, that form the R, the rune R, the Ara, which is the foundation of the altar, which is the stone. Matthew Samael talks about the stone in the book of runes. PTR, Peter, he says, is the stone, the altar, which is, of course, formed by the lower part of the physical body. So the rune R. And above you find the rune Kaum, which is that feminine force, which forms the cup. And then you find your Holy Grail with your body. But did you notice that uh, all the cups, when you will celebrate the Mass, have always in the middle a circle, a sphere? Not all the cups have that, not all the chalices, but especially those that are used in Masses and rituals, they have in the middle that center, which is the heart, of course, the heart. And when you take the Holy Grail, 
you take it by the heart. In synthesis, you have to do the work with your heart. Because in the heart is Jesus. Remember that in the center of your spinal column is the Shushumna channel. And that Shushumna channel is related with the heart. Because the Son, the Christ, relates to the Son, to the heart. And of course, that's Shushumna. But where is Ida? Well, Ida is the very bottom of the chalice. And where is Pingala? Well, Pingala is related with the top of the chalice. Remember that Pingala relates to above and Ida below. It's the two polarities. In the center, the Son of God. Behold here the mystery of the transubstantiation. Which is the mystery of the transmutation. Which is the mystery of Peter. So therefore, when you celebrate the Holy Eucharist, and when you take the cup, you're taking the holy symbol of your whole body. You drink it. And then you celebrate the Holy Mass. Read the lecture Christification in the website. But the Master explains in a beautiful way about the transubstantiation. And of course, this is a marvelous rune and closes all the mystery of the great work. We have to work with the heart. And that's why I said in the center of the cup is that sphere which resembles the heart, that you have to hold it. When you go to any ritual of the Eucharist, you have to humble yourself because the Lord will give you his blood and his flesh for you to eat it in order to receive that strength and to walk in the path. And that's the work of the heart. That's why the Holy Grail shows that. But you are the Holy Grail. When you are entering to a temple, you enter with all respect with your heart. Because you know that that symbol resembles your head and your sex and your heart. The three primary forces that are riding the chariot where Peter is inside. So this is really a beautiful rune. They say, this is a mystery. Nobody knows about it. Yes, I know. Because the whole work is enclosed in it. When you see it. For instance, the rune Kaum, which I told you in other lectures, sometimes is represented by an angle, or a V, or simple with a line, with an arm up. It's a feminine rune related to the feminine forces. So you find here, in the rune Kaun, I mean in the rune uh, Perth, how it is shown. I told you many times that the larynx, the throat, is feminine. And that the sod, the sexual organs, are feminine. And we have to work with it. We have to work with the acacia that enters to the nose. And that's why Master Samael states the pure acacia circulates through the Shushumna channel and its two solar and lunar currents make contact in the magnetic field of the nose when we practice sexual magic intensely. These are the three vital errors of the Brahmanic cord. 
These three vital airs are governed by the inner most, by means of the strength of his willpower. These solar and lunar channels must be totally pure so that the solar and lunar currents can circulate freely through the gangli its ganglionic cords. And in order for the pure akasha of the Shushumna channel to flow freely through the spinal column. The akasha is the cause of sound, the spiritual cause of the word, the anima mundi, the divine, the divine hierarchies, whose breath enters through the magnetic field of our nose. This is why the sacred scriptures say that God blew a breath of life into the nose of Adam and he infused a living soul into him. So, when you go further into this uh, mystery of the rune birth, you find the, the two Johns. Remember that the Gospels talk about two Johns. John the Baptist and John the Apostle. The Apostle. What is John the Baptist? He's in Yesod, in the rivers of Yesod, baptizing with water. Where do we find John the Apostle? We find him always underneath the cross of the crucified. As we said in other lectures, it says to John, Son, behold your mother. Mother, behold your son. Referring, of course, to John the Thymus gland. So, John the Baptist is the one that eats <coughs> wild honey. And between the husbands here in this area, they call it honey to their other half. Because they know that the half of the half of the time is the other half. Without half, you cannot work with the half of the half. And you understand that? Because the half is Tiferet, and the other half is Malkut. But also represents the man and the woman. In the holy copulation. So John is that rune-related uh, uh, force, Sikh which is in the very bottom, the, div the divine father, the Sikh, that works in the very bottom in, in Malkut. And Awas in the throat. If you unite Awas and Sikh together, then you form the Gibor, which is the sexual act, which is the Donum Dei. In the hands of Peter, the two forces, men and woman, in order to work with the third, which is the Lord. It's something very important here. Remember that the twelve apostles of the Lord, before becoming apostles of Jesus Christ, the Savior, they were disciples of John the Baptist. Peter was with him, Andrew was with him, and all the fisher. What they were doing? Fishing, fish, related with the glands, of course. Because in the very bottom, we find Malkut, our physicality, with the 12 apostles. But that is John the Baptist. That is working with the forces of honey and locust. We explain what the locusts are. Lacust, the mighty force of Gebura that descends from Egura into Malkut. That we had to eat, to transmute, but it said. But remember, it is written that John the Baptist was eating also wild honey. What is wild honey? Wild honey is the outcome of what we eat. Physically. Why? Well, honey, you know, is the outcome of what the bee does in his own digestive system. Right? The bees 
collect the pollen and all that from the flowers and transform that into honey in their own digestive system. They vomit it, right? It's a very sweet vomit. Those people that are uh, old, adult, it's good for them to eat honey, wild honey, because that helps the digestive system. And in two lectures previous to this one, the speaker was talking about the uh, weight that we have to eat because we have to produce energy. We have to produce honey because the disciple of the Lord, the adept, has to eat honey. But remember, that honey is not just honey like people think. Oh, it just it does eat wild honey. No. Honey is a symbol of all the transformation of the food that you eat in the, your digestive system. Simple as that. It's coming into my mind now, this disciple of the Lord, Martha. Martha liked to cook in order to serve the Lord. The Last Supper and all the suppers that the Lord had with his apostles, who do you think was cooking for them? Putting the bread and the wine in the table. None of them was, was a cook. The one who was doing that job was Martha. And Martha is in the physicality, which is feminine, related with the digestive system. Simple as that. Martha is that aspect that transform the forces of the Lord wisely. But is in the direction of the Lord. Martha is related with that apostle that called James the Elder, related with the pancreas. You know that the pancreas is the, the organ that helps the stomach to digest what we eat. So this is a relationship between James the Elder and Martha, here below in our physicality. Because this is a work that we had to perform in steps. Don't put your mind too much in heaven. It's good to know about that because we need to understand the path, the map of the, of the path. But we are here in the earth. We have to begin with the physical body. H-Y-L-E, Heil. This is how it's said in, in Greek. Your physicality. <coughs> you have to begin here. Working with your physicality, because it's the foundation. Martha teaches you how to eat, what to put in your stomach. It's always an activity, Martha. While the other Mary, Mary is receiving the doctrine directly from the Lord. Behold here these aspects that you have to understand. The three Marys, but Martha is the digestive system. In your physicality, it relates to other transformations that you have to do. Because here in the physical body, your digestive system transforms everything without your intervention. Martha is working there. James is also working with the transformation. But Martha Samael says, everything that we put in the stomach, when we take the Eucharist, we put it in the stomach. And the stomach transform that and distribute that into the physicality and even the psyche and the spirit. But who is the one that is doing that transformation? It's Martha. With the help of James. But what James, says the master, is the pattern of the great work. Because it is, or they are related with the transformation that we have to do. Beginning with Heil. The physicality. And going into the psyche after that. Because first is the physiology. The physical relation of the logos with Heil. Which is the physicality. And then the psychology. Which is the relation of the logos with the psyche. That's the second aspect. The second step. The third. You find the neuma. The spirit. 
the resin with the logos too. But we are here down. There are no go up because we have to go from the beginning in order to understand. And of course, <coughs> when we find all of this explanation that I am giving to you, the Pieces of Sophia states, it came to pass when Jesus had finished speaking these words unto his disciples that he said unto them, Do you understand in what manner I discourse with you? And Peter stated forward and said unto, his, unto Jesus, My Lord, we will not endure this woman, for she taketh the opportunity from us and hath let none of us speak. But she discourseth many times. And in the Gospel of Thomas, he says, Let Mary leave us, for women are not worthy of life. Well, when you hear that, all women feel like, Oh, you know, we are not <laughs> worthy of life, right? No, 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 no. He's talking about the feminine aspect of us. This physicality that we have is really the outcome of fornication. And Peter, of course, which is the head of the whole work, realizes that the celestial woman, the Akasha, penetrates through the nose and he had to deal with her. Goes down into the sexual organ, which is feminine. And in order to transmute it, Peter, from the pineal gland, has to control her woman too. That woman too. And the spinal column, the Divine Mother, rises through the throat and becomes verve in our lips. And he dis she discusses, he talks. Maybe it's, that's why the uh, women talk too much, you know what I mean? Because they have the ability of that force. But we have to talk in a very wise way. That woman, of course, is in her throat. It's talking right now. Delivering you the logos, the word, the message, which is the Lord. But through my throat, through my woman. And because that woman also rose from my sexual organ, which is feminine, up to the brain. Thanks to Peter. But Peter is very angry against those women that prostitute their forces, their physicality, whether they are male or females. Mm -hmm. Do you understand why Peter is... Just, this woman always talks too much and he's not worthy of life. Yeah, our physicality is not worthy of life. But this receptacle, this physicality, receives all the archetypes. Without the physicality, without the physical body, how are we going to enter into the path? But remember that this physicality is only the half of the half. You have to be complete, you have to have your other half, your other honey. United in sexuality, you work. Hmm? And that's why Jesus says, I myself shall lead her in order to make her male. What is that? Well, in Kabbalah, male is Yasod. And Malkut is feminine. Malkut is fallen. Represented by Mary Magdalene. That's why in the book of Revelation, Malkut is called the great whore, mother of fornications and abominations of the earth. This is the physicality that we have. It's very degenerated. Inside we carry all of that. So we are not worthy of life, or with, better said, of the tree of life which is Shushumna, which the Lord is. But with the science of Peter, the science of the, science of the great work, Jesus teaches our physicality to become a male, meaning to be obedient. 
because the male is pingala, that obeys the head, but the female is the sexual organ that doesn't obey, and you know that. We have to teach the sexual organ how to be like pingala, because Ida is falling into klipoth. Ida into klipoth is Nahema and Lilith, the two psychologists that we had to fight against. And then to rise them from the very bottom. But Peter is the one that shows us that. See, anybody wants to do that, you have to descend to the ninth sphere to put his head, his breathing science in the stone, in the laughter, in order for you to work and to realize yourselves. Peter is pistis. In the pineal gland, we have that virtue called faith. People think that faith is something like, oh, I like this, or oh, I believe in this, so therefore I have faith. No, faith is an energy. It's a force that you develop in the pineal gland. That's why the Master Samael on the Earth states that you have to have faith in order to experience things. If you experience, but you experience that with energy. You cannot go into the astral plane and you are squandering your sexual force. But if you transmute your sexual force and strengthen your pineal gland, then you have faith because you can experience not only the astral plane, the mental plane, or even the sixth dimension. Because Peter, which is faith, has the keys of the kingdom of heaven. But Peter uses the keys, which are Pingalai and Idai and Shushumna, in order to strengthen that faith, which is energy. It comes to my mind now, Thomas. That all the apostles saw the Lord resurrected, except Thomas. They came to Thomas which is rightly in the right part of the brain, related with esoteric stuff, uh, experiences. And Thomas says to the apostles, mm -hmm. I won't have pistis if I don't put my finger inside the wounds of the Lord. Well, the translation says, I won't believe. No, no, no. Pistis is not belief. Pistis is faith. Obviously, if we don't experience certain things, how are we going to develop faith? Which is com conviction of what we know through the direct experience. It's energy. Then when Jesus appears, says, Thomas, don't you have no pistis? But it says, don't you believe? Be a believer. It says the translation is bad. Because every single word in Greek says pistis, pistis, pistis. If you don't have pistis, come, put your finger here. And now have pistis. Like the rest of your brethren. And when Thomas put the finger inside, he says, my Lord, my God. You see? In other words, the energy came and he experienced the truth. And that's pistis. Clearly with the pineal gland. And then he says, Blessed be those that didn't see and have pistis. How do you interpret that? You might say, well, if I don't see things, then I am blessed. No. No, no, that's wrong, you see? Because Thomas didn't see it. You realize that? That the one that didn't see was Thomas. 
he was blessed. How come uh, he says, now be blessed, now you see. Now have faith. But before, after that, he says, blessed are the ones that didn't see. Is not something incongruent there? No, but it says, blessed are the ones that didn't see and have pistis. In other words, blessed are you that you didn't see certain things. But if you have pistis, energy, you will see it. You are blessed if you have faith, even if you didn't see it. Because they said, I don't have faith of actual projection. So I am blessed because I have a lot of sexual energy transmuted in my pineal gland. And I'm going to meditate now and to lie down. And because that energy is pistis, is energy, I will see it. So I'm blessed. But if you are a fornicator, you didn't see it, you are not blessed. Because you don't have faith. You don't have transmuted energy. And that's Thomas. Thomas is that part of us that utilizes that energy in order to comprehend in order to understand things, because in order to comprehend things, in order to experience things, you need energy. If you don't have fuel in your car, even if you want to go to have a travel, how are you going to travel if you don't have gasoline? That is faith that you have to accumulate. That's why it is stated that faith without works is useless. Right? You can do a transmutation here, transmutation now, and accumulate a lot of energy, but if you don't do anything in order to apply that energy to you to experience the truth, it's worthless. Do you understand that? Do you comprehend that? That is faith. That's why it is stated that the hormones of the sexual glands fortify the pineal gland. And the hormones of the pineal gland fortify the sexual glands. It says inner relation. Between Peter and the woman. But Peter is disgusted with those women that are fornicators. But uh, when that woman repents, when Mary Magdalene repents and takes all the seven sins out of her, uh, her body and then becomes Holy Mary, which is the physicality of us. Behold there the, the three Marys. That we have to work with. And all that's Peter. <coughs> because if you don't do and you don't know that, you might think that Peter, the apostle two thousand years ago, was against women, the female bodies. And this is precisely the wrong interpretation of many uh, students of esotericism or Gnosticism. Behold the Catholic Church. Filled with monks that do not want to do anything with women. Because they think that Peter is saying that. But Peter was married. According to the gospel, he had a woman. But he was, of course, uh, controlling also his own particular individual woman. The physicality, the sexuality, the throat. And that's why it is, it, is, it is stated that Peter gives the solution, the idea of repentance in the middle of his brethren. Who are the brethren of Peter? All the apostles, which are inside Mary, which is the physicality. And we are fed through Martha, which is the honey that John the Baptist eats. Together with locusts, which is energy as well. But let me tell you one thing, even if it's not written, he was also eating fish. It would be absurd if, if his disciples, Peter, Andrew, all of them were fishing in the sea and don't give to, to John the Baptist, hey, do you want a piece of fish? Instead of eating locusts and white honey, fish is good too, right? So he was eating also fish, which is the symbol of Keter, right? The water. Because remember that Kete, I mean the uh, Chesed. Chesed is 
the Holy Spirit that was floating in the beginning upon the face of the waters. That's Hesed, which is water related with fish that goes inside the physical body. And how those John the Baptist was eating fish, I'm telling you, through his apostles, his followers, Peter and all the apostles, they were the, his disciples before Jesus. Hmm? Through the glance, in other words, because the endocrine system is related with the twelve apostles. That fish in the water that flows in the organism. But this water, that flowing, is related also with the blood that we're talking about here. So, in the same way that the mother is accumulating, gathering all the energies from her glands and putting that into her milk, especially through the immune system, through the thymus, into her milk of her breast, in the same way that she is feeding the child physically, in the same way the initiate feed his soul, which is the thymus, which is John. The Apostle. Because John the Apostle is the brother of James. That Buddha is fed through the transmutation of the forces of all the Apostles. That thymus, that tumos of breath that we have within, which is part of the Logos. That milk are the hormonal secretions of the endocrine system. It's called milk. Which is related with the sephira netzah. Which is related with the head. So there behold. That. The consciousness. The burata. Received the strength. Of the twelve apostles. When you enter into this path, this is how they were fed, or feeding the soul. And this is how John the Baptist was developing. He was growing up thanks to the milk of the hormonal system, the endocrine system, thanks to the honey of what, we, of what we, he was eating in the stomach, thanks to the locusts. All that is energy of different aspects. That you have to transmute in order to build within you John the Baptist, which is the terrestrial man in the very bottom. What John the Baptist said when they were approaching, with the disciples were approaching John the Baptist. What do we have to do? They ask in the Gospels. Well, he says, if you have two coats, give one coat. Help the ones that is needed. In other words, he was saying, love each other. He says, every bodhisattva always teaches that. Love each other. And Jesus, when he comes and is baptized by the bodhisattva through sexual magic, start teachings. I mean, start teaching the, the disciples of John. Peter comes and becomes a disciple of the Lord. And all the disciples of John become disciples of Jesus. But there is another step that you have to understand. That we have to do inside of us. When the Lord comes. And then all that that we are preparing now. Because we are preparing our physicality for that. Our psychology as well. When we reach that level, which is the half of the half of the time. Then the Lord comes. Which is Sophia. Because Peter is pistis. We have to develop pistis. Here in the top of the head. We have that faith. The seven serpents of fire. That have to rise. 
When that pistis is developed, when that soul is ground, when that soul becomes John the Baptist, when we have created that soul, then the Lord appears, which is Jesus, symbol of Jesus. And I want to give another step. And then he goes into our endocrine system to that archetypes and tells them, you were fishing from their, your physicality, the forces, so you are a fisherman. But I will teach you now how to be fisher of men, which is another step in which these faculties are developed more in another octave. And the disciples of John become the disciples of Jesus. And he teaches the same as John. He says, well, love each other. This is my commandment. The same that John was telling you. And later on, on the cross, John the Apostle says, love each other. Read the letters of John the Apostle. Is always teaching that. Love each other. Because the thymus gland, the Apostle John, is close to the heart of Jesus. He's that intuitive mind. The logos, the word that had developed in us. Because in the beginning it was not developed. But now at this age when he is below the cross, that Buddha is completely awakened, completely developed. And he says, love each other. Because that was the force that gave, took me to this level. Love. So John the Baptist says, love each other. Jesus says, love each other. And John the Apostle, love each other. Behold the phrase that unites the three of them. John the Baptist is in Yesod. John the Apostle is in Etzach. Is the intuitive mind, the man that was developed through timus, the essence, the consciousness, the burata, because Jesus, the heart, the center of the Aztec calendar. So you get that? The, th the two Johns and Jesus are related. Something that we had to, to work in the beginning. But first you had to go to the level of John the Baptist. That's why Jesus said to Peter. Because when the Master, some, uh, the Lord was resurrected. Was talking with Peter. Peter. Peter, do you love me? Oh yes, Lord, I love you. Well, take care of my sheep. Do you love me? Yes, Lord, I love you. Take care of my lambs. Peter, do you love me? He says, my Lord, I love you. Right? Three times. Because before the rooster sings twice, you will deny me thrice. Peter denies the Lord three times. And what do we have to do with this that follow us? He says, what was John? Let him be there waiting. Because first we had to work with Peter. With the great work. Later on, John the Baptist. And then John the Apostle. Of course, the three denials of Peter is something that we have to understand and comprehend. There are three steps in the great work. What is the rooster? It's the one that awakens the day, the logos. Before the rooster sings twice, you will deny me thrice. And the gospel says that uh, the first denial of Peter, he denies the Lord. And then the rooster sings. And he remembers. They said twice. But then he denies him the second time. And the third time, and with the third time it happens, and then the rooster sings again. And then he remembered what Jesus said to him. And he repented. You know, he repented. 
the repentance of Peter are related with three steps that we have to understand. First, we have to develop that pistis, that faith which is Peter. To build the church. Because we have to build the church on the rock. That is sexual transmutation. We have to build the astral body, the mental body, the causal body. That is to build the church. When the tower of Belen is shining on top of our head. is because the church is already built. Belen. Is a Aramaic word. Or Chaldean word, which means tower of fire. Belen. Bel. Tower of fire. And that brings me into my mind uh, the abode of the light. It says the place of uh, the light where the light is found, Barbello. Bar bello. Bar in Aramaic means sun. Bell. The sun of the fire. The sun of the light. Bar bello. Which is on top of Keter. Bar bello. So when the energy are, has risen to the top of the head, when it's in the pineal gland, and then the crown, the chakra of crown, is the aureola of the saints is shining there. The light of Barbello in our physicality or in our psychology as well. Because the true light of Barbello is there in the absolute, the solar absolute, that descends. In order for that Christ, which is Barbello, which is in the absolute, to descend, how to descend through Keter. And to Chokhmah. And to unite with Tifereth. United with Tifereth. That Chokhmah. Which is the cosmic Christ. Which is wisdom in Hebrew. Is Sophia. In uh, Greek. So when Sophia enters into Pistis. What do we have? Pistis Sophia. This is the moment in which the initiate, that is already a John the Baptist, a man, a human being built through Peter, receives Sophia, the Lord, the Christ, the wisdom. And that is a union of two forces, the human soul, Pistis, and Sophia, the Savior. But in order to receive Sophia, you had to build pistis. You had to build faith. If you have faith, like the size of a mustard seed, you will move mountains. Do you hear that saying? In another lecture, I told you that the feminine, the small faith, is in the sexual force, the sexual glands, in the seed. If, for instance, the man places his seed in the womb of a woman, that small seed will become a physical body, a child, right? And who's do who does that? The Holy Spirit. In the womb of the mother. A simple small seed. So, if we take that small seed, that feminine force of the sexual glands, which is in the seed, that's a symbol of a mustard, the size of a mustard seed. If you take that faith, little by little, then you will build a lot of faith in the top of your mountain. Have faith like the size of a mustard seed means transmute that energy that is in your seed, which is like the size of a mustard seed, and even smaller. Right? If you transmute that energy, it will rise to the top of your head, and you will move mountains. 
But it's not what the people think or have faith, believe in this, in this little thing and you will move mountains. No. It's energy. The small faith is in the sexual energy. That's the small. That's what is the feminine, the small faith. If you transmute it. You see the monster seed, it says when it grows, it's like a big tree. Okay? With all the birds of heaven are having their nest. Same is thing, all the birds of heaven, the archetypes of heaven will come and nest in you if you do that. If you have faith like the size of a monster seed. Remember that it's not about believing. It's about transmutation. And Peter has to deal with it. And what Peter said, this woman always interferes in all the work that we're doing. Yeah. Because the woman is receptive. She receives all the force. It's our physicality, our physical body. And it's talking now through my throat. What will I do without throat? I will have words. That's my feminine organ, my da'at. But if I don't transmute my feminine force, which is like the size of a mustard seed, my faith won't be developed. Because little by little is how Peter received his strength. But those that fornicate, they don't have that faith. They just believe in something. But we are talking here about experience like Matthew. Like Thomas, in other words. Have faith. This is a part of us that have energy and utilize that energy in order to experience. And then Peter becomes more in haste. But we have to descend to the night sphere in order to do that. And there we have to fight. That woman, the sexual organ, that woman of desire, will defeat you like Dalil, Dalila. And you will be always sad because Dalila is stronger than you. But you believe to be a Samson. But in the sexual act, Dalila says, no, no, you are not Samson. I am stronger than you. And then you deny the Lord. To deny the Lord is to fornicate. Physically or psychologically. So the initiate feels sorrow. Do not think that all of us that come to here already are Samson's and defeating. No, we are defeated in many ways because the Lord is denied three times by Peter. You have faith here, accumulated. But when we are tested, sometimes we fail. And then Peter, which is the faith, shrinks. The, little, the faith that we have in abundance is shrinked. Because the one that feeds that faith is the little faith which is in the sexual organ. is a feminine force. It's ida, in other words. Mm -hmm. And then uh, you feel remorse. But when you conquer the first denial, and then you resurrect in the fire and in the light, and you become, overcome the first denial. But then you enter, according to the path, into all the levels. Working with the moon, with Mercury, with Venus, with the sun, etc., etc., until Neptune. And during that path, Peter also is defeated many times. Because you have to apply meditation. That's the second denial. The three steps. And the last denial is the eight days or the, the eight years of job. When the, finally the initiate is tested. That's why the Master Samael stated in the Revolution of the Dialectic. The one that works three hours in sexual magic is respected. Somebody there read that and didn't understand and, and thought that he has to practice three hours daily and went to the master. 
very proud. Master, what do you think about uh, working in three hours in sexual magic? Because he was doing it. Martin Samael said to him, lust, lasciviousness, what else? <laughs> I mean, and what about the three hours? Oh, you are reading mechanically. Three days. After three days and three nights, the Lord resurrects. First hour, first mountain. Second hour, the second mountain. Third hour, the eight years of job. Those are the three hours. Usually, initiates reach only the first hour. They reach mastery, that's it. Rare are the ones that practice the second hour. And they rare the ones that take the third hour. The three dials, three hours. Symbol. Of the time, as we said, the time is a symbol. If you read everything mechanically, you don't know where you're going. <coughs> and you start practicing, you know. After that, they cannot, they cannot even walk. Three hours of sexual magic. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> well, it's always one hour, as much. But uh, in three times. Remember, before the reservation, three days. Or three hours, if you want. So don't read everything mechanically. You don't understand that. That the apostles are within your physicality, related with virtues. Peter is pistis, faith, because he is the one that directs the whole work. And when he builds the church upon the rock, the astral body, mental body, castle body are built. And John the Baptist appears, thanks to him. Because he is the one that has the keys of the kingdom of heaven. So, Andrew is a strength, as we said, sexual strength. John, emotional love, or intuitive mind. Philip, the creative power of the word. Philip is in the, in the thought here. Related with the science of the Akasha, the fifth chakra. Bartholomew, his clairvoyance or imagination. James the Elder, cognizance. Thomas, wisdom. Matthew, willpower. James the Lesser, order. Related with the, the appendix. Simon from Cana, seal. On the back of your, of your neck. And your neck is called hind brain. Judas Tadeus, elimination, created with the coccyx, and Judas Iscariot, the sexual power. So Judas Iscariot, of course, you know that, is related with desire. Every apostle that came 2,000 years ago was represented part of these forces of the 12 that were around the heart. Because remember that the heart, through the blood, is that flowing that takes the milk, which are the secretions of the endocrine glands, and the honey, which is the transmutation of the energy of what you eat, which is created by the digestive system. So there you find the rivers of milk and honey within you, which work in your particular Eden. Do you have questions? You talked about three Marys in uh, Christianity. And uh, I know two of those Marys, Mary the Mother of God and Mary Magdalene. Who is the third Mary? Is that Mary the sister of Martha? Uh, the first Mary, Mary the Mother of Jesus, Mary Magdalene, which represents the physicality. And, uh, but the, all of those Marys represent in different levels the same uh, aspects of Mary, you know. And Mary, of course, is the Akasha, the energy that enters through your throat. It's a feminine force that takes the three breaths of the Akasha. That's the Mary of the cosmos that enters into your system. And Mary in your nature is in your sexuality. But Mary, uh, uh, the physicality 
is also part, you know. These three Marys are the, in different levels inside of us. This is what you have to understand. For instance, Mary, in our physicality, is all related with Martha. Right? It's the same M. You see the M represents the feminine force. M. Remember the, the, the lecture of the letter M. It's the mother. Mm -hmm. So it's a feminine aspect that we have within our physicality. And also represents the woman. The woman also have all. That's why the woman, you know, have the milk. Right? We have to feed ourselves with that milk of our endocrine system that runs in the blood. And the energy of the honey as well runs in the blood. If you take the milk and the honey, you find the sun and the moon, the silver and the gold. Remember that Peter has those, one key of Peter is silver and another is, is uh, gold. Or milk and honey. Everything is in relation with the physicality and with the two polarities, Idapingala. That's why somebody stated that there is a third key, which is in the middle. Yeah, that's the key really that is appearing with the transmutation, with all this transformation that we have to do through the rune Perth, which is Peter, the stone. So, remember always, <coughs> the three Marys are the three aspects of feminine aspects of the Holy Trinity. Study the, study the Holy, Holy Trinity in the physicality and your psyche and different aspects, and you will find always that the three Marys are there. We always work with the three Marys whether you like it or not. That's why, uh, as a male, you need a Mary also. And a woman which, who is Mary, representing the feminine aspect, is a male. Even male, you know, begins with mem. So, do you have more questions? Do you understand what Peter is? Yes? Peter just wants you to um, explain again the Hindu graphic that you have on there. What is the meaning of it? The Hindu graphic is showing us the three Devi. The three Devi are the three feminine aspects related with the Holy Trinity in Hinduism Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva. Christianity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Because we always state, people usually think that the Holy Trinity are three males. Holy Spirit is a male, the Son is a male, and the Father is a male. No, are three androgynous forces that relate to the physicality too. So the first feminine aspect, which is related with Keter, the Father, is Sarasvati the wife of Brahma. The second aspect related with Chochma, Vishnu, is Lakshmi, the feminine aspect of Christ. And the third is Parvati, which is the feminine aspect of the Holy Spirit, Shiva. So these are the three, which in Christianity are called the three Marys, related with the forces of Akasha, with the science of breathing. The science of breathing is in relation with Peter. Remember that, that the clue, the keys of Peter are the breathing system, the polarities. Matthew Samael states that very clear. The three charioteers are the three primary forces that guide the chariot. That chariot are the bodies already created. The Merkava is called in Hebrew. Chariot 
is English. Merkava is Hebrew. So the Merkava is physical body, astral body, mental body, causal body. That's the Merkava. And the three that are guiding that Merkava are the three primary forces inside of us. But the one that is doing all that work with the three primary forces and with the Merkava is Peter. The Greek work. The completion of completions. Through the 24th Arcanum, which is the weaver, which is the six, which is Tiferet. All that is very Kabbalistic. Now you understand as well uh, about uh, the two flows, the two lobos, the two lupus of the famous word uh, given by the Matthew Samael, her colubos, the mighty force of the law. Esoterically speaking, Kabbalistically speaking, in us. Because remember that Gebura has two poles. Every single Logos has two poles. One negative and the other positive. Positive uh, ray of Mars is Elohim Gibor. And the other is Andramelech, the head of the Hanasmusen. You go to the left, you go to the Hanasmusen with Andramelech. You go to the right, and then you go with Elohim Gibor, with the Rune Gibor, in the right way, to the right, clockwise. Because if you do it counterclockwise, it's like Hitler. He knew about this science, but he's working in rotating the Gibor in the opposite way, clock, counterclockwise. That's negative. That's the way of the Hanas Musen. Because Hitler knew that, but obviously he was a Hanas Mus. Pretty clear. He never disintegrated the ego. And all those that do not disintegrate the ego turn the Gibor in the opposite way. But to turn it in the right way. Question? Don't the uh, celestial bodies uh, move counterclockwise? Well, the celestial bodies always move mechanically. Because the logical movement of the laws of nature are the counterclockwise. The evolution, Tiphon, descends to the left. And Anubis ascends to the right. This counterclockwise. That's the mechanicity of nature, not only in any planet, but in the universe. For you to enter into the self-realization, you have to turn the Gibor in the opposite way. And that's precisely the work of Hercules. Do you look from the point of view of the absolute downward and visualize that as a spiral? Then it kind of wanders up, wanders down. Yeah. The spiral going down and up. Obviously, uh, uh, everything is mechanical in this universe. But through the science that we are teaching here is how we work against that. That's why it is very difficult to find self-realized people. Because Marcy Samael on the or explains that in, in his books. That nature fights against the one that wants to control it. And nature turns counterclockwise, you know, leaving life to the all kingdoms. And you come and says, I will command nature, and I will do it in the opposite way, and I will control it. And then nature says, try me, try me. And very few succeed, because first you have to fit your own nature, your physicality. And then nature, right, in the planet, and then in the cosmos. And she fights with all the strength. But if you defeat her, well, you are a conqueror, becomes her son. See the magic flute of Mozart, you will see there. How nature works in favor and against. You know, this is in us. We will start working with the transmutation in order to start the path of Peter. And nature says no. And works against us. And so we have to insist and insist until we conquer the first level, which is Heil, the physicality. This is how you begin. Then you enter into your psyche. Another question there? The question is, is that the fight Jacob had? 
Oh yeah, of course. That's the fight of Jacob. That's the question. Is that the fight that Jacob had with, uh, with the angel? Yeah, of course. It's another, another step. Jacob is Tifereth. When you reach Tifereth and you have already your bodies created, when you are in the half of the half, then Samael appears in another level and says, fight with me. If you defeat me, you will receive your sacred name. Right? And become a son of God, a son of the sun. But believe me, it's another thing in relation with it. In this work, you have to help the lower monads. Because this is precisely the path of the middle, in which the initial helps the lower monads to rise. How do you help them to rise? How does Christ help you when you incarnate? Christ enters into you and starts making a revolution mean revolving the gibor in the clockwise that's what the lord does to work against because the other forces like judas pilate and caiphas retain the will in the opposite way and the lord comes and do it in the opposite way he is a rebellious it's against everything and then he does it and then with that action from your very psyche, he's turning you, taking out with his own essence, which is the fire, your conscience in another level of solar man, uh, galactic man, and beyond, a cosmos man. But in the same way that he helps, we also have to imitate him. How do we imitate him? When you eat your vegetables, your plants, your cereals, you are helping those monads that are in, the, in that kingdom through your transmutation to elevate them in the higher levels. Because if you ate that with all uh, with a lot of hunger, whatever, and you go and fornicate, you are sending them down. But the real initiate eats that, drinks the water, eats plants, eats cereals, also eat flesh because he loves the animals the monads of the animals also need to go up so when you eat the flesh of an animal and you transmute that you are elevating that monad helping showing it how to do it but if you are a vegetarian okay it's good but uh, how are you going to help the animals by teaching uh, giving a lecture they don't understand uh, English or they only understand uh, animal language. But if you eat them with the law of the cosmic trouble auto egocrat and digest them into your own honey and you transmute it, and then those monads, because the elements are in that flesh, will feel elevated through your spiritual work. Now, if you are not doing that, well, it doesn't matter if you don't eat uh, meat or you don't eat anything. But if you're doing work, then you understand why the human being feeds himself with the three inferior kingdoms. Animal kingdom, plant kingdom, mineral kingdom. Because we need to help those monads too. And for that, you kill them. Because when you eat an apple, you are killing the apple. Don't think that only when you eat meat, you are killing the animal. No, you also destroy the life. You enter there and suffers and digest it. So that's precisely the meaning of the work. With a panka tadwa. Of course, I am not teaching you how to be, as the matter said, carnivorous. But you have to help those animals too, especially in this day and age. They suffer. They need to... Eventually, these animals will become intellectual animals. And they will receive, well, when I was an animal, somebody ate my body. And I felt how he transmuted the energy and elevated me and taught me through experience that. That's the law of the cosmic struggle auto egocrat. You, you, not only to, to be swallowed and to swallow. It's a, it's a process, psychological and spiritual. It goes even to the monad. Because anything that you find has a monad, has an intelligence, has essence, 
whether it is an apple, whether it is water that you drink, whether it is honey that you eat, or a piece of meat. Fish. Do you have another question? Thank you very much. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Gloria and Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Thank you.